It's 1983. Andrew Spencer has just shipped his first game, International Soccer, on the Commodore 64. While 1983 was the year of the famous Atari crash over in America, here in Britain the games industry was coming on leaps and bounds. This is mostly due to the success of the home computer and the bounty of cheap indie games that could be turned around quick by bedroom coders just like Andrew Spencer. Spencer followed up the following year with High Noon, co-written by Steve Wiggins and published by Ocean. High Noon is a relatively primitive game, and it has some relatively binary morality. Our hero, who happens to be all dressed in white, is bringing this very imperialistic law and order to this foreign, chaotic land. But this all started the cogs turning in Spencer's head. It was when jobbing for companies like Ocean, CBM and Epix, where Spencer started dreaming of something bigger. He'd started developing this idea for an open world game, which expanded on the ideas that he'd laid out in High Noon. Spencer wasn't particularly passionate about making sports games. He was more interested in where the technology and the storytelling tools intersected. And when the Commodore Amiga dropped in 1985, that new technology represented a huge jump forward. The time had come for Spencer to realize his vision. A vision of an open world 3D horror game about a medieval traveler marooned in a village which is overrun with monsters. A world unbound from the confines of a basketball court. A world divorced from rules and law. A world where chaos rules supreme. Spencer would tap into the untold power of these new computers. He would realize a revolutionary 3D graphics engine with animation far smoother than anything the 8-bit micros could have managed. Spencer would then spend five years writing the engine and the tools for his new big game, Ecstatica. You might be thinking that this is all too bright for a horror game and by modern standards, you would be right. You might be thinking that the ellipsoid 3D looks a little bit silly. And yeah, but for a second, let's just think about context. Polygonal 3D was still in its infancy at this point, and there was no real way to know that that was gonna go on to be the de facto standard. It was very clear in these early days that realism was really not something that was on the table. So quality was governed by different means. Style, expression, dynamism, the smoothness of animation. The potential for smooth animation was what attracted Spencer to ellipsoids in the first place. And Spencer wrote some really sophisticated animation scripting, which meant that Ecstatica's creatures had a far wider range of animation capabilities, especially if you wanted to compare them to the blocky zombies and the chickens from Alone in the Dark. Now this is all still really sophisticated technology for 1994. This is all pre-3D acceleration. This is all done in software with 256 colors. This is before the days of dynamic lighting. There's no real-time shadows. This is all done with Gouraud shading. Ecstatica had started life on the Amiga, but it very quickly moved to the DOS PC. Amigas all used Motorola 68000 CPUs, all clocked in around 7 MHz. You could add an additional maths coprocessor, but the Intel 486 started at 16 MHz. That doesn't sound like a lot, of course, but this is far and away more sophisticated than anything a home console could even dream of conjuring up. If you were to run Ecstatica on what would then have been considered a cutting edge Socket 5 Pentium running at 100 MHz, you would have capped this game out at the engine frame limit of 56 frames per second. To give that further context, 3D games were really only available in the arcades at this point in time. It would be at least a year before you'd see these kind of graphics on home consoles. Daytona on the Saturn ran at 20 FPS and Ridge Racer on the PlayStation ran at 30. They both released a year after Ecstatica. Ecstatica was a really technically impressive game. It had over 250 pre-rendered backgrounds. It had over 700 animations. It took over 100 megabytes on a hard disk drive, which for the time, trust me, that's a huge amount of space. I really want to make a point of how impressive this is for 1994. I think the only games which may really have looked better than this were possibly X-Wing or TIE Fighter, and really that's just subjective. 
all the manual really gives you is you've stumbled into this village on your travels it's been taken over by demons do what you can if you hope to leave alive <laughs> now you might turn around and just try and leave straight away but the bridge falls down you can't leave that easily there is always this scripted event at the beginning where you trip over this rock and this is just brilliant storytelling i think you're not playing a hero here you're not playing some mighty warrior they're a fucking imbecile <laughs> It's already just starting with this jokey tone. You might see this funny little imp of a thing here. You might beat him up and then you might feel like Jack the Lad. Look at your character walking around with their jaunty little walk. This is a jolly little game, isn't it? And then you turn around this corner and then boom, a fucking werewolf. And it kicks the shit out of you as well. Immediately, this game is putting you in your place. It is not fucking around. I played Ecstatica as a kid. I reckon I would have been about eight or nine years old when I played this, but anyway, this game scared the shit out of me. The whole village is like unlocked from the beginning. You can freely explore it from the off, but everywhere you go, it's just hell. There are people crucified, there's people hanging from the rafters, people on spikes, there's just death and gore and horror everywhere mate it just got under my skin there's something about that dichotomy between the dark satanic imagery which the game puts forward and then this weird joyful humor it upset me then and its tricks still work on me now i grew up watching loads of these weird old cartoons from the 1930s cartoons like the cobweb hotel and the pin cushion man and i don't think they're really what you would call horror but they just really gave me the willies, man. There's something about just how cheerful everybody is. Despite what you're being shown on screen, despite the setting, despite what's going on. Even cartoons that weren't supposed to be scary, things like Somewhere in Dreamland, they just have this like chubby creepiness to them. It's just uncanny. It gives me the ick, man. And I think it's the same thing that's happening here in Ecstatica. I should probably say that because I was young and I didn't know anything about DOS games and because my parents didn't help me with anything, I never actually figured out how to get DOS games to run with sound. I played all of my games in silence. So I played Ecstatica with no music, no sound effects, just the low hum of the PC, the clacks of the keyboard and just me. And this game still scared the pants off of me. I think that is testament to the atmosphere. But anyway, I kept on playing. I kept finding all these weird little things, all these creepy little corners of this village before just getting killed and then starting the game over again. Everywhere I went, the game presented a new way for me to die. I don't think I even got that far in it to bother making a save file, but I would just cheerily boot the game up and away I would go. I'd feel this weird compulsion pulling me back to the world of Ecstatica. And so I would keep running around this village with no real sense of direction, jumping out of my skin whenever one of these monsters turned up, just getting killed over and over again. Firing this game up some 25, 30 years later, uh, I've not visited this world in decades, by the way, but I was hit with that same curiosity, that same tight feeling, which I'm now adult enough to recognize is my anxiety. Where do I go? What do I do? I'm trapped in this village against my will, and I need to find something. There is a puzzle here that needs to be solved. There is a lock and I just don't know where the key is or even what the key looks like. And Ecstatica is one of those games that's just brutally unfair. Like how King's Quest would just kill you for being curious or because the game's creators thought it would be funny. The Way Alone in the Dark would encourage you to read all the books, except that there's that one book that will kill you if you read it. Ecstatica kills the player too, and is just so gleeful about it. You find a suit of armor in the blacksmiths. The problem is, it's so heavy that if you trip over, your character can't ever get up again. And then this fella saunters in and bashes your head in with a giant hammer. Now it's a good laugh for you watching this, but Never being able to fully trust this game again means you can never let your guard down. 
Save scumming before entering or exiting a building in case a statue sets you on fire or a trap spikes you up the bum. To the point that when you find another actually good suit of armor later in the game, you're unlikely to put it on because you're expecting that it's gonna kill you. Even good news is hard to take in Ecstatica. As if that hostile environment wasn't enough, Ecstatica then also has a master stroke to ramp up the anxiety the entire time. That werewolf from the opening sequence, now unlike other enemies in the game, the werewolf can't be killed, and they can go anywhere the player can go. The werewolf will set ambushes for you. They'll reappear time and again to haunt your actions throughout the game. So you can't really ever slow down and take your time. You, you're basically always running. This makes the werewolf the iconic villain of the game. This is Mr. X five years before Resi 2 did it. If you ever find yourself toe to toe with the werewolf, your best option is just to wail on them just enough that they back off for a second and then you just leg it out of there. It is the inverse of that white Wild West myth of bringing order to this untamed savage land. This savage land has its own power and its own agency. You're not some hero wading into town bringing law and order. You're the victim. You're not here hunting the baddies. The baddies are hunting you. Every nook and cranny of this village is a potential ambush or a potential trap. There is death around every corner. I found myself simultaneously overstimulated and also crushingly lonely. I'm claustrophobic and hopeless and paranoid all at the same time. Like Alone in the Dark, if you know what you're doing, then you can probably complete Ecstatica in under an hour. But you would never figure out what you're supposed to do without spending time in all of these uncomfortable feelings. You have to explore the village if you want to figure it out. There are no shortcuts. The village does have a hard boundary all the way around it, so it does the thing that Alone in the Dark did and that Resi actually did a couple of years later, and that is that it goes down. Both the village's fort and the church have passages underneath them which lead down into this winding labyrinth of stone tunnels. The surface world is connected to and held up by these ancient angry forces which have been forced into obscurity, literally forced underground, only to come angrily spilling out. Spencer had admitted that the camera and the tank controls were essentially lifted from Alone in the Dark. One thing that I really appreciate about this game is the hudlessness of it. There is no health bar. You can read your character's state by reading their body language. There is no inventory. You can see what your character is carrying in each of their two hands. It keeps you in those uncomfortable feelings for the entire time. There is no escape from these feelings. And while we're on the subject, the combat is fucking nails. <laughs> there is loads of wind up on these animations and whiffing them is absolutely brutal. The only real key to surviving the combat is to get a rhythm of stun locking your opponent and then just never letting up. Like I said, your character isn't a hero. There is no flashy option. You've got to pick your battles and you've got to cheese it. You've got to use every angle you've got or you just got to avoid it altogether. And in fact, running might actually be the smartest option every time. Years into Ecstatica's development, the game was becoming too big for Spencer to make alone. He'd made the tools, he'd made the engine, his idea of an open map filled with monsters and traps was becoming real, but he needed a tapestry to hang it all on, he needed a story, a direction, a reason to want to stay in this world. He brought in animator Alain Mandron, who contributed not just the character designs and the animations, but also expanded the story and the medieval setting. He was inspired by something extremely cutting edge and extremely cool in the early 1990s, anime. Wow. Mandron specifically name dropped the violence and the chaotic themes of Akira, which released here in the UK in 1991. Now far from the futuristic Neo-Tokyo setting of Akira, Ecstatica is set in the village of Tyrik in exactly northern Europe 
in 928 AD. The reason that Tyric is experiencing this demonic incursion is because of a young witch called Ecstatica. It turns out that Tyric has a long history of pagan religion. Stone circles, ancient gods, they even have a lady in the lake. Ecstatica is a talented young witch who has been researching and practicing the old ways. She stole a magical book and accidentally summoned a demon. She tried to banish this demon herself, but the demon was too powerful. They put Ecstatica into a coma and unleashed all of their evil little mates upon the town. As written, I think that story presents a very sanitized, very 1980s church-centric view of paganism. I choose to interpret this story as a story of church oppression. A folk horror story, one about a secluded village whose traditional customs, which are all visible on the surface and obvious to everybody, have all been suppressed by the presence of the church. The books which contain the knowledge of the old ways are all locked up in Tyric's monastery. The church are attempting to erase the pagan roots of Tyric. They are being forced figuratively and literally underground. Ecstatica learns about these old ways, about how the standing stones were used to protect the village from evil spirits, and her curiosity gets her ostracized by this now predominantly Christian community, which also drives her into seclusion. These old spirits, no doubt angry at having been abandoned and being labelled as evil by this invading church, reach out to Ecstatica, just as she is reaching out to them. Back to the game, once our character finds all the right relics and performs all the right rituals, they can finally face the big demon that started this whole sorry mess. This involves being knighted by the lady in the lake, by the way, by the authority of the old gods. Order and peace is eventually restored to Tyric, Ecstatica is reawakened, we get to ride away into the sunset, it's a lovely Hollywood ending. I think it's very cool that it's the authority of the old gods that brings about the good ending, not the presence of the church. It's just a kind of cool little folk horror thing that's here in the game and isn't really spoken about much. I think that's pretty cool. The reason I laboured over that story so much is because it's been quite difficult for me to figure out where the inspirations for this game lie, except for this loose melange of late 80s pseudo-pagan folk horror stuff. It's a modern fantasy fairy tale about these secret worlds that are happening right next to our own, about secret horrors which nobody really wants to wander into. I think it's similar to something that Clive Barker or Neil Gaiman would have written. I mean, Spencer looks like a Fields of the Nephilim fan, so I bet he's read Sandman. Slaunia, a dark fantasy comic appearing in 2000 AD, could well have formed some of the inspiration here. It is also dark and violent and gory, and it also has some very strong pagan themes. In very 2000 AD fashion, it's also got loads of like really weird jokes in it too. So that feels like it could be part of this. I can't shake the idea that BBC's Robin of Sherwood from the mid 1980s also played a part here. That show took parts of the Robin Hood mythos and merged it with real life history and then took some pretty wild liberties with the source material by heavily mixing in all this pagan mythology. It was friggin rad. Mary Whitehouse didn't like it due to all of the extensive violence, the depiction of black magic and generally the whole unchristian vibe of the thing, so that's how you know that it was good. And while we're on this wild speculation flex, I figure as a British nerd, there's every chance that Andrew Spencer played a game of Warhammer in his life. That's a very British kind of mythology, you know, combining real myths, taking real world historical figures, and then just a liberal amount of cribbing from existing copyrighted material, all mixing it together with some dark fantasy themes and a good old pinch of potty humour. I feel like this is the mixing pot from which Ecstatica emerged. When it came time to find a publisher who would fit, Cygnosis were it. Responsible for games like Shadow of the Beast and Agony, Cygnosis always seemed like something of a rockstar games publisher to me. With their hand-painted box covers by Roger Dean, who had worked on albums by Yes and Asia, Cygnosis were just so metal, and Ecstatica was extremely within their wheelhouse. 
Ecstatica's cover art actually was painted by Carl Critchlow. Now his expressive dark paintings had been used for Warhammer and 2000 AD before this, so I really feel like this really ties the whole weird British dark fantasy thing together. On paper, the content of Ecstatica seems very adult, very mature. Violent computer games were a really big deal in 90s conservative Britain. Mortal Kombat had upset all kinds of mums and so therefore it was declared that all games that featured any amount of nudity and or violence had to submit to the British Board of Film Classification to get an age certificate. Spencer says that despite the UK's strict censorship laws at the time, Cygnosis didn't actually attempt to curtail any of the vision that Spencer and Mendron had in this game. Now, due to the pagan subject matter, the depictions of murder and torture, and the fact that the main character is characterised as a victim and not a hero, Ecstatica was met with an 18 certificate from the BBFC. I couldn't really say whether that helped with sales or not, but looking back, <laughs> that's something. Ecstatica landed extremely well with the press. It was getting 80% and up, and these are the days when 80% meant 80%. Some reviewers at the time even said that it was the logical next step from Alone in the Dark. It was building on what was laid down by Reynal and Infragram, but it was in fact pushing what Alone did to the next level. Edge magazine called Ecstatica genius. They said it was one of the most exciting, gripping and startlingly original games of recent years. PC Zone praised the artistry and the smooth animation. They gave it 93%. At least two of these magazines feel the need to mention the female character's curvy bum. They don't mention that it's the same bum as the male character. They conveniently leave that out. This is just a reflection of that lads mag kind of vibe that these magazines had at the time. Of course this isn't a reflection of the game. The only reason I'm mentioning this is because I think it's important to just have some history, some context around this game, just to give you an idea of the culture that this thing was coming out into. And maybe we can hope that moving forward, people are better about female protagonists in computer games. Anyway, as far as I can tell, Ecstatica didn't really come close to the level of commercial success and certainly mainstream awareness that Alone in the Dark did. I couldn't really say whether it had any real impact on those games that followed like your Resident Evils or your Parasite Eves, but there is zero doubt in my mind that Ecstatica is an important step on the road to what we would call the survival horror game. It has all the hallmarks of those early survival games, right down to the fixed camera angles and the tank controls, the male and female playable characters, and even a sort of branching story. It displays so many traits that would become iconic parts of that genre. The isolation, the limited inventory, the brutal combat, having to find books and journals to find out the story, solving environmental puzzles using rudimentary stealth mechanics, all while being stalked by that one invincible slasher villain that just won't let up. Both Mandron and Spencer spoke about the huge potential the emerging games industry represented. They knew that they were barely scratching the surface of the medium's potential. They recognised that the tools needed maturity and that teams would need to be scaled up even further than what was considered normal then of a team of 10 or 20 people. They saw a future where combining technology and storytelling had the potential to overtake films as the dominant force in entertainment. Spencer did actually upscale his team for Ecstatica 2, and he had big plans for the technology that he'd spent a decade creating. But the incredibly fast-moving 1990s suddenly went in a direction which Spencer hadn't seen, and so his tools were left at a disadvantage. It's possible that this technology always would have had some kind of upper limit, but it would have been fun to have let Andrew and Alan find those limits themselves. It was tough to get the full history of this game. I found a lot of articles and interviews, but I've had to take a few leaps of faith along the way. 
This wasn't really a big name. It wasn't really a massive success. For a game released two years after Alone in the Dark and two years before Resident Evil, Ecstatica isn't really remembered anywhere near as well as either of those. But hey, that's why you're here. You've watched all the way to the end and I'm madly appreciative of it. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this, maybe together we can form some kind of pagan ritual. We can try to summon Ecstatica back and we can get it released onto GOG or Zoom or something like that. Thank you very much for watching this all the way through. I love talking about weird, random old spooky games from the 90s and the 2000s. If you like that kind of thing, please subscribe to the channel. There's more stuff coming out all the time. I've also got a Discord and a big shout out to my channel members who kindly contribute a little tip to me at the end of each month. I think I'm going to leave that one there. Thanks again. I'll see you in the next video. All right. Ta-da.